Hi, this is On Mind with Andrew Archer. Today, our guest is Angel Uribe. Welcome back. Uh, she's the owner of Stages of Change. Uh, she does alcohol moderation, management with people. There's uh, classes you do, mm -hmm. including domestic violence, anger management, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff uh, related to issues with addiction, legal problems. Mm -hmm. So thanks again yeah. for, for coming on. Always fun to, yeah. to have you. Uh, before we started, you were talking about a training you yeah. did recently and kind of some interesting stuff that happened there. Yeah. So the um, training, it was a tall cop. I was basically talking on drug trends and um, just kind of uh, making us aware of kind of what's lingering out there. And it was about all the legal stuff, actually. So the stuff that you're going to find in your grocery stores, your your um, gas stations now, um, and then obviously some of the shops that are popping up around and stuff. And um, the kind of the, the tagline was, you know, high in plain sight. And so mm. I went to that um, this last week. It was a really was like me in college. <laughs> right. right. It was really informative. But, um, you know, one of the things that was kind of striking to me was um, that we're we're so worried. We have so many opinions, right, about the classification, the hard drugs versus mm -hmm. the soft drugs and the, you know, what are we scared of? What's the monster of the moment? And what are the we sort of just, them. right, what are we bringing in and allowing now? And and then the thing that kind of, I think, stuck with me is how no matter what's going on, there is so much half-truth and misinformation that mm. the stuff that's going on right in front of you, people just seem to be so blind to or oblivious to. And the stuff that's that, you know, you, you would think or people that traditionally have like fears around, they still don't have a, a solid understanding even of mm -hmm. what the issues are with those different mood altering chemicals. And so um what I what I Right. I mean, even the psychi away, the psychiatric language yeah. is like altered states right you know it's just like what there's just mean? different states of yeah. mind and even things like nicotine mm -hmm. alter your state of mind yeah. to some degree you know yes. psychotropic just means mind altering so lots of things yeah alter it but there's some that are scary right more scary to people based on their backgrounds and ideas about them yeah he made a he made a comment at one point where he said uh you know this is basically he was talking about like stacking um uh you know substances on top of one another and he, he he says you know for instance for the you know some of you in here statistically probably use a vape and you go outside and you use your vape and then you come inside and you drink your starbucks and then you you know get your your pop in the at, you know at the at lunchtime and mm -hmm. and so he was making a case to say you know that there's there's a there's mood altering chemical use going on all the time we classify some as good and okay and then even socially, you know, um, um, kind of the the it thing to be doing, right? Carrying mm -hmm. around your Starbucks cup is is quite popular, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but the the thing that really stuck with me was the fact that we're heavy on, you know putting out there this is the problem this is what's going on this is what's out there you can see it anywhere you go and and you know you're not going to get away from it but there really wasn't much offered in terms of like how do we solve this mm -hmm. and there was even a parent who's who was there um it was largely comprised of like probation and um um social workers and you know people who work in the substance use realm um but there was a parent there and she was like what do i do how do i stop this, you know, you know, with my kids. Um, and I think if we would do so much better, whether we're talking, you know, locally or even you know, nationally about how do you address these things? Because you're not going to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do, somebody's coming in. I mean, it's free market kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And so you have to sort of start talking about, well, what are what are solutions that we can bring to the table um, just m in a microcosm of the world we live in, which is usually the the mm -hmm. five people around us that we have the most influence over, right? And generally that would be our children, hopefully, right? <laughs> yeah. Or our spouses. But um, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. And I, I, I appreciated the training. It was a really good one um, for pointing out a lot of things, but they were talking, you know, he was talking about the fact that right now with the legalization of marijuana um, in a lot of states, that now has moved 
already and we just had that happen and we've already yeah. started to see people talk what was about it, let's, january yeah. or no last summer or yeah, something just, like? it's just been in the last it hasn't been a year yet i know yeah. um but now people are talking about well let's let's talk about legalizing shrooms <laughs> Okay, great, right? <laughs> like all the world problems we have, let's let's <laughs> let's find another class of drugs to to push now, and and mm -hmm. we don't know very well. Well, yet. and it's important to say there's distinctions in terms of okay, medic medicinal use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need a prescription. Recreational use, yeah. you don't need anything, um, and you can buy it at a store. Right. Versus decriminalizing or legalizing it. You know, so right. people that are using mushrooms on a one-time basis from they don't end up in prison yes. for it. You know, the, the yes. it gets, you know, into the kind of weeds with that. I imagine uh, fentanyl came up yes. in the conversation because yeah. that's the big one that everybody's afraid of right now. You know, one of the things he said that was kind of like took me aback a little bit is he said, you know, when fentanyl first came on scene, we saw a lot of overdoses and people not surviving them. Mm -hmm. um, but he said with with the increase of it um, out here, we're now seeing people become, you know, tolerant to it to a certain extent. And he said that, you know, you would think, okay, well, that'd be the top end. But no, now they're going to come out with other drugs that are new and different and all of that. And so mm -hmm. really shifting our conversation, I think, is the first place we have to start. It's like, yeah. you're not going to punish your way out of these things. You're not going mm -hmm. to, you know, get people to stop by making things so hard on them. As a matter of fact, it, yeah. it's usually quite the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. That the more difficult reality becomes, the more appealing escape is. Yeah, well, that, right? that's where the war on drugs appealed to our fears right. about yes. them and the conflation between a drug and addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when uh, maybe this is too personal, <laughs> my wife, you know, had one of our babies, it said fentanyl on the epidural yeah. that she got. Yeah. Now, she didn't go out and use heroin the next day. And, the, you right. know, she wasn't addicted right. to it. Still the exact same drug. I mean, I'm sure the yeah. doses, were, you know, were different. But, you know, you go in for a surgery and you get morphine. It, there's certain people that are more susceptible uh, yeah. and not the drug. Uh, I think of Carl Hart. I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, but but he really emphasizes this. In terms of things even that we think of as like, oh, you're going to be addicted and die like – um, heroin or methamphetamine, you know, he's been able to show that, no, very uh, basic kind of like reward incentives where you mm -hmm. give people money and then they <laughs> won't use. So, like, so it's not just, it's not right. the drug specifically, but, um, you know, I, I pulled part of this is kind of ancient history at this point, but the first presidential debate, <laughs> which now we have different people running and, and stuff. Uh, but between Trump and Biden, I think this was the end of June. So Jake Tapper asked Trump, uh, this is quote, let's discuss an epidemic impacting millions of Americans that both of you have made a top priority in your first term, the opioid crisis, which this is thanks to uh, right. Purdue pharmaceutical companies, you right. know, but that right. they said, oh, this is an addictive Oxycontin. Right. Yeah, right. right. Uh, okay, so he says, and for both of you, the number of overdose deaths in this country has gone up under your term, meaning Trump, it went up under your uh, or Biden and also Trump, it's gone up. So former President Trump, despite the efforts that both of you have made, more than 100,000 Americans are dying from overdoses every year, mm -hmm. primarily from fentanyl and other opioids. But there's a lot of them that are prescribed or right. people get, you right. know, right. Uh, what will you do to help Americans right now in the throes of addiction who are struggling to get the treatment they need? And so Trump says, well, let me go back. <laughs> I'm not quoting him now, but let's talk about China. Yeah. If it weren't for China <laughs> uh, is what he basically said. Starts talking about tariffs. China is going to own us if you keep allowing them to do what they're doing. Except, you know, is this mm -hmm. politics of fear mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is what he's promoting. He's saying they are killing us as a country. China mm -hmm. is killing us. They buy our, all of our debt and make all of our products. I don't know yeah. how they're <laughs> killing it. Right. And he right. says, Joe, and you can't let that happen. You know, he, he basically says that that Biden is a uh, Manchurian. Oh, he literally says he's a Manchurian candidate, meaning he's been brainwashed mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. China. OK, so then ta uh, Jake Taver goes, uh, so President Trump, you have 67 seconds left. The question was, 
what are you going to do to help <laughs> Americans in the throes of addiction right now who are struggling to get the treatment they need? So then he starts talking about COVID and jumps to uh, the border. So now, if it weren't for immigrants, and they're all the drug users and drug addicts and working for cartels, or what? this is the fear-based thing. Yeah. The amount of drugs and human trafficking and women coming across the border. Okay, so the assumption is that immigrants are bad, right. and we need to stop them. And that's why we have drug problems, is because right. of the open border, which is a great way to dodge the question. So he doesn't answer the question at all. And then Biden starts talking about fentanyl and the machinery to detect fentanyl. So this is just the war right. on drugs you know yeah. fast forward is what they're focusing on not solutions like like you're saying um so then tapper goes back and <laughs> says and again you know talking to trump the question is about americans in the throes of a day i mean this is like very important we need to right. press politicians it's like answer the question you're yeah. not answering the question yeah. the throes of addiction right now struggling to get the treatment they need um and again, he goes back to talking about Mexico <laughs> and that how, you know, he was wonderful and everything was going wonderful uh, when he was in office and just doesn't answer the question. So I'm curious, you know, either if you were a moderator or you're kind of in their position, like what would you actually be talking about in terms of, yeah. you know, I doubt it would be immigrants and I doubt it would be right. China <laughs> right. that you would right. focus on right. or detecting Drugs, which have, you know, there's t plenty of drugs in here in yeah. the country, and people are addicted to lots of things other than fentanyl. Right. I mean, d certainly people are using it and dying it, but. Well, from your perspective, you know, what's really yeah. the issue, or what would you do, yeah. you know, if you're, if well, you're the one in the castle? <laughs> yeah. I would say, you know, the, the, the drug epidemic is a really good indication of how, you know, capitalism is working great. In America, right? Like, well, that's true because it's, it's all through American <laughs> yeah. dollars, right? That it, is getting the it, drugs are being purchased right. across borders and everything. So it's all part of the circulation right. of our money. If you have a demand in this country, there will be someone ready to supply. That is, mm. that, that's just free market, ain't it? Like, yeah. isn't that yeah. what it is? And so, what I, my question is, how do you lessen the demand? Because everything mm. that usually gets talked about in the political realm is, outside of the person yeah. it's outside of the individual right and if if you don't deal with the person and the things that is is driving that person to feel compelled to escape their reality then how in the world are we you're not going to you're not going to punish your way out of this you're uh -huh. not going to lock your borders down to you know to get rid of this most of most of the drugs that are coming through are are being allowed at the port. It's it's, mm. not, it's not you know some monster of, that's just bringing it in and in the middle of the night you know getting past the guards. The guards are standing down, and you don't have you you don't have the problems without the access being given right. And Is this through like you bribes, yeah. like bribing oh, the yeah. guards? Okay, you know, yeah. I, this might be a little you know too risque too, but my father is actually first generation from. Mexico. Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, he's been in this country for, oh my gosh, probably going on 60 years now. So he's been here. He's, he's you know, well established. But in the early days, he did not come through the channels that we talk about people they should come through and all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And there were three times in which he was returned to Mexico. Um, it took him no time to get back. And I asked him, Dad, you know, how did you get here? And he said, I just drove through the border, like mm -hmm. through the through the port thing. And, yeah. and, and I said, but how could you do that if you, you know? And he's like, well, because the person I was with paid the guards and the guards just let us through. Oh, interesting. And it changed my perspective on things because, you know, back in the, in the former president's um, term, he talked a lot about building walls. And so, um, you know, I asked the question, well, does that, you know, what do you think about that? And he he just kind of looked at me with a like a, hmm, you know, it's it's a waste of time and money because that's not how it's happening. Well, well a lot of people fly. A in lot of people will stay. fly in. They will <laughs> drive in. They will, you know, yeah. and so what we're missing is the fact that you cannot stop anything that is determined to make its way in. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with the demand that is out there 
for people. Yeah. Why do we have well, such a Well, it's like the dam that broke recently. Right. He's like, we need to stop this water. Nobody said that. You just redirect right. it. Right. And you make, you know, obstacles for the path. But that that energy, like you're saying, that demand, yes. you can't get rid of it. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, I think, both Trump and, and Biden's kind of existential position is like they're they're – pretty arrogant and they think right. that they can just get rid of yes, people. I mean, if you go it. back no. to Biden in the 90s and mm-hmm. the omnibus crime bill, but but Trump is the, in TA, it, it, they refer to existential positions because the mm-hmm. the promotion is I'm OK, you're OK. Yeah. So, so we're not fundamentally different. We all have issues, right. you know, we're intelligent, beautiful. Um, we have problems. But for, for Trump, he adopted I'm okay. You're not okay. You're not okay. Yes. <laughs> Which is an arrogant, like I'm going <laughs> to yeah. get rid of people. So we need right. to get rid of, and it's, but it's apparent, there's a paranoid flavor yeah. to that. Um, yeah. And so it's these others, you mm-hmm. know, immigrants where I step back, it's like, why wouldn't we want immigrants here? Actually, right. when the more immigrants right. in communities, the lower the crime rate is. Right. I mean, I've studied this stuff. So it's like, right. it, but but clearly in this example, in the debate, it's to evade getting into the, right. the solutions. And I think, you know, you and I would probably um, agree. I just pulled Johan Hari's book, Chasing the Scream, off mm-hmm. of, it was my wife's book. So I was on her bookshelf. It's like, Talking to people like Angel, I gotta, I gotta yeah. learn about this, the word on drugs yeah. and stuff. So I haven't, I haven't dug into it yet, but um, education, housing, mm-hmm. healthcare, yeah. like what are you getting? Because that, that's all related yes. to, to talk about that maybe. It addresses the demand. The problem that you have, and, and just to and Loneliness clarify, too, I didn't mention yeah, that. When what, what my father's perspective showed me is if you are constantly focused on what's outside, you are not dealing with the, you know, what would lead to the issue on the inside. Right. And so that, that changed my perspective, you know, as a young person too, which is ultimately played into my, my work. And Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, with my clients, the three things that I get told over and over again, that are contributing to misuse and abuse of mood altering chemicals is stress boredom and social networks, right? And I I just had a client this morning, I said, and I would argue that some people are bored with their social networks. And Mm -hmm. and so they're just trying to numb that out, right? Um, No, no pun intended. I know it's a social time here in Minnesota. We love our, we love our people. But um, the thing that I, I think is so critically important is if you, if you do the work on the person, if you heal the conditions that are driving people to feel helpless, hopeless, powerless, you know, Mm -hmm. feeling as though there, there is nothing that they have within their wheelhouse to make changes that are meaningful to them in a way that allows them to want to keep showing up, then of course, escaping with, you know, four or five drinks a night is going to appeal more than than sitting in a state of of dis-ease or discomfort. We're hedonistic creatures by design. We're not created to stay in excessive and prolonged exposure to mm-hmm. that discomfort, dis-ease, or distress, right? Yeah. And so if we— Well, historically, we would move on. Right. <laughs> we, would, yes. we would migrate constantly. That's right, yeah. because that's our human nature. It's our human condition. And so if I was going to be sitting there, I'd say, well, how are you going to help the things that are in, that are creating the disempowering feelings that people have mm-hmm. that are putting them in positions where they're like, well— you know, to, to either take the edge off or let's just go off the edge altogether, right? Because yeah. the alternative of staying with this is just not not ide- ideal. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things about the training that I went to is it was heavy on, you know, letting us know all the things that are out here. And I appreciate that knowledge and it's so good for us. But I'm like, I, I, we're going to need to start shifting to how do you respond? Not how do you react? How do you Mm -hmm. respond? Right. Because response means we're thoughtful, we're considerate, we're we're taking our time to actually understand what we're dealing with. And reaction is we don't know it, we don't understand it, we're confused by it, and we're scared of it. So let's let's block. Let's try to let's Mm -hmm. try to block. Let's try to keep the focus um, on the monster, the thing that we should be fearing, so that we we all put our energy towards the confusion yeah. rather than the than to seek clarity. It's a red herring. So, yeah. you know, what would you do if you wanted, you know, much of the population addicted to things? Well, it's what we're talking about, you know, hearing from politicians is this politics of fear. Oh, my God, mm-hmm. it's the border. It's the immigrants. You know, yeah. it's, it's fentanyl, which, of course, there's problems. Um, 
with those things, but to distract us from mm -hmm. how do we improve our communities yes. so people have connection with one another. Yes. Uh, but so what you would do is you would isolate people uh, and you would keep them, you know, wanting crave. I mean, this is yeah. kind of consumerism, but also all work and no play. There's mm -hmm. a script in, in transactional analysis. This comes from Claude Steiner, uh, joylessness. Yeah. So it's just all work and no play. And you discount the sort of need to play yeah. and be, you know, just go on TikTok or, you know, play games on your phone and stuff. So you increase the stress because of the debt. Yeah. I learned recently that only 25% of people in the US actually own their homes. Like right. they own it, not right. JP Morgan or right. other banks and stuff. And so, and then you're bored because we're like hyper stimulated, yeah. you know, yeah. online, but but nothing to do if you're especially thinking about people that are have to work remotely or work from home. And then like what you said, social networks, well now social networks are Facebook yeah. and Instagram versus actual, you know, connection yeah. with people. But I think this is a good, um, transition take me a minute to get there but is there more you wanted to say on that note no i think it's it's a good to be having like this conversation because we have to start taking our eyes off of the things that that are the fixing on the problem is not is not going to help us find solutions well right because it's always yeah. security and surveillance yes. is going to be the solution right. to it right because Just that make sure we we can measure the fentanyl coming through right. the border yeah right and i think <clears throat> the other thing too is like we we have to stop even vilifying like drugs themselves or like as this one is is the devil and this one is okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because what you do is you keep division of attention and and focus and well and that's the politics looking. of fear too right we're supposed to hate each other if right. we have different views have different on things views. Yeah. yeah yeah and that's the thing is like i used to do this segment in my um alcohol and drug education classes where i would where i would um basically break down and, and have people tell me you know how do you ingest this drug and then they would you know i'd say okay so it's alcohol and they'd say well you drink it okay well when you drink it goes to where let's say your stomach and then okay your mm -hmm. intestines right and then it absorbs to your bloodstream and your bloodstream carries it to your brain and i would go through that with each and every mood altering chemical including and not limited to coke meth heroin all the ones that people traditionally would identify as hard drugs or you know or or evil drugs or whatever have you mm -hmm. and at the end of the thing i'd say you know what it, it all ends up going into the bloodstream somehow, no matter how you took it in, no matter how bougie it seems yeah. according to the trends or whatever, it in, you ingested it, it absorbed, it went from your bloodstream to your brain. Your brain doesn't know what it's high from. It only knows the sensation of being under the influence. doesn't know how it got there, nor does it care, right? Just It's just there to have the experience. And I tell people, I'm like, you have to stop looking at hard and soft drugs as this one's okay and that one's a problem because what ends up happening is what i've watched for years is people with even within the culture of chemical use they will judge each other right like hmm. the people who drink alcohol judge people who smoke marijuana people who smoke i've marijuana heard that in terms of aa and na coke. stuff yeah. those groups yeah. yeah and everybody who everyone who picks their poison so to speak they basically look at what they're doing and they put a justification on it and they say well yeah but at least i'm not doing xyz mm -hmm. right with mine superior right yeah. even your prescription medications you know people are like what do you mean i have a prescription for this now they're their whole judgment for the heroin user but they're using percocets vicodin you know all the things yeah it's not that dirty but heroin they, right yeah. because they, pres they a doctor prescribed it right? right so it's just the if we have to we have to dismantle the tendency towards vilifying that which is not what we would prefer mm -hmm, or choose. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, a drug is a drug is a drug is a drug, right? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, and so if we could just, if we could stop assigning mm -hmm. the kind of and what's um, the motivation to be you, you know burn inspire rhetoric yeah yeah burn say it's instead of other people yeah so if you're attached to that thing could be food could be money could be yeah. alcohol like yes and so you put that as a priority versus mm -hmm. other people yeah right? and that's it's pretty simple it and, and you do that because you're afraid of intimacy yeah being intimate with people um so I like what you said, because let's move on to other drugs that oftentimes we don't think of as drugs because you can call rhetorically, you can call them medicine. Right. You know, you can call yeah. ayahuasca medicine or you can call it a drug, you know, mm -hmm. drug depending on your perspective. Um, 
we're, I, I'm realizing we're we're going to hit all the sort of taboo topics today. <laughs> we already <laughs> talked about immigration, capitalism, the CIA, which you might not know, um, was experimenting in the the 40s and mostly the 50s with LSD. Mm -hmm. They're giving LSD to people that didn't didn't know they were but you know i remember when i was in high school and it was like mdma would make holes in your brains and stuff mm -hmm. and so you're really afraid of right. it and so you think lsd acid trips it's like oh my god it's terrible for you but the some of the um individuals in the cia like um uh sydney gottlieb who th this book uh, poisoner in chief by stephen kinzer i mean it reads like a novel it's really interesting uh but he used this sydney gottlieb used lsd like 200 times <laughs> you know like so like it, his brain wasn't damaged from this because this was just a chemical that you know gets into your bloodstream very rapidly but interestingly as we segue into um psychotropic drugs uh like antidepressants eli Lilly was making the lsd for the cia mm -hmm. you know kind of wink wink stuff mm -hmm. but we're talking about um it was it was measured in tonnage which means like <laughs> shipping containers <laughs> full of value oh, you know this is yeah. large quantities hundreds of thousands of dollars which would have been millions i'm sure mm -hmm. um so this is a pharmaceutical company and and eli Lilly in 1988 came out with um prozac that everybody knows about um and this is something from Loretta Napoleoni's book, um, uh, Maonomics. Uh, she's an economist, so she's talking mostly about China. And here she's not talking about um, the U.S. or psychotropic drugs. Um, but interestingly, um, you know, and we can talk about the placebo effect uh, in a moment. But she says that, and this is an economist perspective, the source of the malaise afflicting the West isn't the kind that antidepressants can treat, but rather our style of life. Mm -hmm. And so it is a bit, a little bit long, but I'm curious your response to this. So according to the World Health Organization, WHO, since the beginning of the 1990s, the number of depressives has increased precisely in the countries in which indebtedness has assumed biblical proportions, the rich nations, and roughly in proportion to the average increase in individual debt load. I mean, I remember coming out of undergrad, looking at my, for the first time, looking at my loan statements, I'd be like, oh my oh, man. psych degree ain't going to pay for this. <laughs> right. So she says, depression and defaults, therefore, are multiplying where wealth and democracy reign, starting with the United States, the richest and most democratic country in the world, and spilling over into the stock markets of Global Village, while we obsessively ask the economists when and how GDP and employment will start growing again. But neither psychoanalysis nor economics is an example exact science they lack the instruments to give us this type of certainty so i have you know i've thought about that but never heard it and read it in such a mm -hmm. such a real potent way but this connection between debt and uh depression your thoughts on that yeah absolutely well of course i mean if you look at you know you're going to work and you're you feel at a certain point where no matter what you're bringing in there's no there's no room for play there's no exactly. time for play there's and it goes i equate, towards all these debts yes and i equate play with creativity when i think of what it you know a lot of times people would say well i you know i'm too old to play or i'm a, I'm a grown-up you know whatever right we take on that role of being you know we're, we're supposed to be responsible we're supposed to you know till the till the fields like that's what mm -hmm. we're here to do right <laughs> but the thing is is like i i don't know if we talked about this in a previous um time we were talking but one thing that I didn't understand early until I was actually teaching my classes one day was um, I would have them do this exercise where I'd say all right the next thing we're going to do is you guys are going to draw me a picture that represents your past present and future relationship with your drug of choice and uh, so I'd, I'd pass out papers and as soon as I brought out crayons or markers it would like the room would just fill with the voices of telling me oh I, I don't draw I can't I can't color I, I don't uh, you know I stick people <laughs> and this that and the other defensive right it yeah. was just very much like a like immediate right walls go up and they're 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 there to tell me about what they can't do do. And I kept, I kept thinking, why are, why do people keep wanting to share that with me? Because I'm like, this isn't a competition. We're not, you know, I'm not going to make sure you're drawing within the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and so they were afraid to play. They were afraid to play is what it came down to. And so I did yeah. a little bit of research, and um, they 
I can't remember the source, but they were talking about by the time we hit adulthood, 80% of adults have shame triggers around creativity. Okay. Well. <laughs> it's not rational, we, right? right? We're supposed you, to be rational actors. Right. Yeah. If you equate creativity and play together, um, and then you think about, you know, the, the debt issue, well, if there's any shame that gets triggered anywhere, I don't have the right or the, I don't deserve to play. I don't deserve to have time down. I don't deserve yeah. to have happiness because I have debt, because I have, you know, I've got bills, I've got this, that, you know, and we have all mm -hmm. of these things that keep us sort of outside of ourselves. And the, the recognition of the fact that the more time you take to care for yourself in that way, give yourself that time to play or to be creative, mm -hmm. the more productive you will be and the more, you know, the, the more likely you would be than less likely to see your way through whatever challenges present themselves financially or otherwise in life, right? Mm -hmm. But that's one of the biggest things is like you can't, I well, almost that's where it's, it's a burnout it society. Singular. Right yeah. Now. There's, yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, points that are passed along the road to burnout. And I think you can't really look at them as being a singular contribution to the status of our world. I, the depression issue and, and mood altering chemicals, I also say this a lot of times too is like, you know, if you, if you, don't recognize the fact that we are pleasure seeking creatures from the day we're born till the day we die. If at any point in time you are not a pleasure seeking creature, you walk into a doctor's office, you're walking out with a prescription and a diagnosis of clinical depression. Hmm. Because depression is what? The absence of pleasure. joy, yeah. pleasure, and the ability to experience pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. Well I mean I would just put an asterisk. I would I would say connection seeking, but there's yes. there's you know Love is a form of pleasure. That's like exactly it feels good. right. Yeah. yeah. And depending on what you've come to define pleasure as, right? Yeah. If in its truest, most pure forms, it does have to do with connection because usually what it is that brings the greatest pleasure is that connection we feel to our loved ones and the experiences we have with them, right? Mm -hmm. But if we don't feel like there's time because there's bills or there's yeah. debt, of course. You're on the run, so you pick up the, a pack yes. of Marlboros and yes. an energy drink. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And 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 it also, the, it of course, the substances the um, can help you escape mm -hmm. the idea of that you're in all this debt. Um, and, and so it works kind of both ways. So you know, uh, Napoleon is really good at she's she's pulling this macro perspective that this this economic. Um, engine of growth, which leads to recessions and people being into debt, um, isn't this just this abstraction that economists can measure with numbers? It's like right. it affects us internally. Uh, and so she's, she's, you know, this is the hook is like, um, you know, credit allows us to live beyond our means, mm -hmm. you know? And so she says, in other words, we live in a mirage in which lines of credit have been mistaken for wealth. So what yeah. what happens on the HGTV shows as soon as the you know they do this fabulous makeover of this yeah. house and it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and they celebrate. Yeah, look at our amazing house. They don't own it. They have a thirty year mortgage right. and they're celebrating <laughs> right. that they're taking on this debt. But then that gives you right. meaning right. in life. Is like I got to pay off the debts. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, <clears throat> really interesting. Um, to, to make those connections between the larger, you know, economic system and what actually happens. You know, mm -hmm. personally, you know, I work with a lot of couples. So then what happens is uh, it's referred to as a debtor game uh, in games people play by Eric Byrne is like, one person, let, let's say we're married and I corner you and say, what are we going to do about all these debts? Like right. we got to we gotta <laughs> right. tighten yeah. up our belt buckle. Like we got to do something about it because I'm really, I'm scared because I'm yeah. thinking, oh my gosh, like how am I going to pay off all this stuff? And then you can get defensive. But at any moment, you know, you can have this argument about debt, which is this, it's technically abstract, you mm -hmm. know, it's just, um, uh, but it gives you something to really argue about, to focus yes. on because what happens when people are, going into retirement, a lot of times they don't have debt and they don't have any purpose. Right. What am I supposed to do right. with my life? So it's a, it's a weird kind of, you know, yeah. I guess money just becoming a kind of religion, right? Yes. <laughs> like in our society yes. specifically. And so one way to have a kind of lifestyle is use, you know, relatively inexpensive drugs to like feel, yes. feel okay. Yes. Uh, but it's, it's driven by that assumption that like, if you have this thing, even if you don't own it, 
you're happier. Right, right. Well, as a coping strategy, drugs and alcohol are 100 percent effective. That's mm -hmm. that's also a problem, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Because if I if I'm feeling a certain kind of way and I, I, I want to feel a different kind of a way, um, it's going to take me a while if, you know, if I'm having to fix big major issues in yeah, my life. you got to think and solve right, problems. you got to think and solve problems. It is nothing. You don't have to think about anything other than, like, put the car and drive and get yourself to wherever you need to go to get the cigarettes, to get, mm -hmm. you know, the now, I mean, you can go to the dispensary and get whatever you want there or yeah. a liquor store or a bar, right? You don't have to put that much thought or effort into your life or into your relationships. And quite frankly, after, you know, a short time interacting with your drug of choice, you don't care. That's, that's, that's mm -hmm. the other thing, right? Is we're, let's be honest, as human beings, the idea of being carefree is so, so good because we want peace of mind. And that's, that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. To be carefree mm -hmm. is to know everything's going to be okay. You We're okay. Safe. I feel safe. Mm -hmm. We're all good, right? It's core human needs, right? And they are being met and you're like, oh yeah, this is good. Well, if you can't get it in a, in a real meaningful way, that's okay. Cause there's a, uh, there's, you know, tickets, you know, you can buy at the counter at the gas station to escape that for a few minutes and mm -hmm. scratch off, you know, while you're in another world dreaming about a quick fix or, you know, have that couple of drinks. And man, all of a sudden, everything, the, the little, um, I always call it like the little, remember the old um, heaters that had like you'd turn them and they'd make the hissing sound, uh -huh, like yeah. let the pressure the valve radiator, off. Yeah, radiator, the radiator yeah. heaters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like, you know, again, none of these things, I don't think of drugs and alcohol as being inherently bad unto themselves. It's, yeah. What is the person's pursuit of it? Why are they in pursuit of it? More mm -hmm. so than being in pursuit of like going and reaching out to their spouse or finding that that friend that they can have a meaningful conversation with about the struggle. Most of us don't need someone to fix our struggle. We just need to know that there's somebody there that we can we can have a conversation and connect with, with and empathize yeah. with us. And if you can get that, a lot of times that's that is serving a much higher purpose than, you know, what the drinks do. But a lot of people have gone by way of the cheap fix, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the expense of the connection. Yeah. And, you know, now that you're t talking about, um, you know, essentially escapism mm -hmm. with, with drugs, if you're using it to escape, it uh, had me thinking about um, passivity strategies. That's one thing I focus on in psychotherapy with people. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows uh, one passive strategy, which is doing nothing. Yes. <laughs> so, so yes. like, think that the baby's crying in the middle of the night and you go, nah, go back yeah. to sleep. Yep. It's like you do nothing about it. So, so here, uh, let's get back to, okay, you're in debt or you lose your job mm -hmm. or something. The, the easiest way to do nothing is to go yeah. and use drugs or whatever. So you, yeah. then you literally don't think about the problem mm -hmm. and solve the problem. So it's a passive strategy. Now right. that's different if somebody invites you to happy hour and you're not in a crisis right. and then you just go and have a drink. Just so it's really, what is yeah. your motivation to, yeah. to use the substance? Cause now I want to shift, you know, more into um, psychotropic drugs. Like I was saying, um, Prozac is launched in the mm -hmm. late 80s and it's actually, you know, we're talking about economics here. Um, the chemical imbalance theory, which basically says you have, if you have low depression, or excuse me, the serotonin levels in your brain mm -hmm. are low, then you need a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac, like Lexapro, these different things. Then it increases the serotonin. Right. Uh, but that was a marketing strategy. Yes. <laughs> and so what happened was the doctors repeat what the pharmaceutical companies say about it. The patients now start because we have direct yeah. to consumer advertising, so you can see a commercial for yeah. for the Eli Lilly products, and then you say, "Oh yeah, I got a chemical imbalance," and then you get it. You know, yeah. it's only us and I think New Zealand that has direct to consumer advertising, which would be a e real easy fix. And I think yeah. we would all agree we're sick of seeing all those yes. commercials, Nobody people likes running the commercials. on the beach and like, <laughs> you know. And so <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> so that you know was one of the most I think the lu most lucrative kind of marketing mm -hmm. campaign in his history because it people are still using things like Prozac uh, and stuff. But who I really like, people watching this can see um, Irving Kirsch's book, The Emperor's New Drugs. He uh, He's a psychologist, Irving Kirsch, and he worked at Harvard studying the placebo effect. So, you know, kind of like you're talking about 
with drugs and alcohol um, the in a little bit different way with psychotropic drugs, it has a lot to do with what you and the con mm -hmm. clinician believe yes. is going to happen mm -hmm. for you. Um, but I assume you get, um, you know, clients that have issues with prescription drugs yeah. as much as other yeah. drugs, right? Yeah. And that, you know what? And I, my thing too is just thinking about is like, you know, every drug known to man has medicinal value. Every, mm -hmm. every drug we have has medicinal value in some way, shape or form. Right. And so to, to say that we need to get rid of any of it or that it, you know, it doesn't serve a purpose that could be of use to people. Like, especially right now, we're talking about like the psychotropic drugs and stuff where they're using them to help treat like PTSD and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's amazing. Whatever it takes to help people feel more at ease in their own skin or in their environment, like let's not. Let's not shut the door to exploring that, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the the things that is so so crazy to me is how there is such a there big pharma has has made itself a bed. Right, because it's <laughs> it's it's pushed itself so a king size yes, a the... king size bed. And the thing is, is like I will listen to people all day long tell me, I'm not going to a doctor because all they want to do is just push pills down your throat, right? Mm -hmm. um, or I tried their pills and they gave me horrible side effects. And well, it's know, just part of this like, ecosystem it, where you have lobbyists yes. and commercial marketing and, and everything I, too. And I think part of it is because yeah, doctors are like you said, they're not well versed a lot of times in it. Um, they're, they're brought a thing and somebody says, well, this, this will help your patient and they want to treat mm -hmm, symptoms. Mm -hmm. That's what they're there to do. And if they cure something along the way, well then great, that's great. But mostly let's, let's diminish the symptoms you're going through. But the problem here is for people who are going in and they're like, well, I'm, I'm depressed. Okay. Well, can we talk about what might be really going on rather than a, like making an, a presumption? Oh, you have a chemical imbalance. And now well, if you didn't have one before you went in, you'll have one when you go out. Because as soon as you start adding chemicals into exactly. the body and you start messing with There's microbiome. A dependency and, just like any other oh, medicine anything. drug. Yeah. Right. And so it, the, the hard part for, for me as a clinician is the fact that there's so little done to try to understand, well, what is it? that's really going on, you know, or are you just, are you having a hard time connecting with your wife right now or your mm. husband? Are you, you know, are you, yeah, yeah. Are your children struggling with some health issues and you, you know, you don't know how to necessarily resolve it. Are you in mm. debt? Mm -hmm. You know what? And so there are so many um, ways in which we could solve this in a much, <laughs> much easier way. But um, alas, I digress because I could go on forever about it, but the, well, it, all there's of this also sort of a, just becomes a cocktail of stuff that just perpetuates um, a problem. So, like, there are real solutions possible when it mm. comes to medications, but unfortunately, because there's so little clarity and information and knowledge base, we make judgments and assumptions every day, right? So people nowadays, they don't want to go to the doctor because they're afraid they're going to get medicated. So yeah. they'll just go to the dispensary and medicate themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. we're, and either way, we're not getting to the root of, of the issue. Well, and one separates you from people, the other one brings you together. Brings you with together. People. But the, yeah. the, you know, the chemical point. imbalance theory, there's a bunch of built-in assumptions to that, which one is um, you're an individual you mm -hmm. are an island to yourself, right? But also, who you are is your brain. That's another mm -hmm. kind of assumption, and and so the the next one is that depression is caused by something chemical. When right. technically everything's caused by chemical yes. in terms of conscious experience. So you so you have all this built into that 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 you know attaches to a mm -hmm. very individualistic mm -hmm. culture. And if, if people are interested in this, this is a great book. Um, crazy like us, uh, globalizing the American psyche. I'm blanking on the author's name right now, but he has a section where um, he talks about Japan, which you know over time has become more mm -hmm. basically Americanized, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it, much more collective orientation. Things like Zen Buddhism are there and stuff. And so, what um, different pharmaceutical companies had to do was to educate, uh, I'm using air quotes, <laughs> educate yeah. Yeah. the culture to basically take drugs. And so part of the advertising was that they said to the Japanese population, um, 
depression is like a cold for the soul. So Ooh. like when you have a cold, you take medic medicine, right? And you're sick. And so, so it's a cold. So now all of a sudden it fits yeah. with this chemical imbalance. And then very quickly, they're taking large numbers of um, psychotropics in, in Japan. But so shifting over to the placebo effect, people think a placebo effect, oh, like, I'm, I'm just stupid. I got duped and I took mm -hmm. something that wasn't real. Um, psychotherapy, there's a huge placebo effect. Mm -hmm. As soon as people make it into my office, mm -hmm. whew, they feel a little bit better yes. just because they have ideas about what therapy is going to do. Yes. So part, so what goes into this placebo effect is like I was already saying, you are your brain, you're your head. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a Western idea. You know, yep. you need to be rational, yep. not creative and spontaneous. Right. So, so brain and mind are equated yeah. as the same thing as well. Then you have a clinician like myself, who's wonderful, as you already know, is just the, <laughs> course, the greatest yes. clinician yes. ever, gives you this diagnosis, which we could spend a whole mm -hmm. couple hours on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. But so now it's real. Okay, mm -hmm. this concept, this is you. And then also you have a therapeutic alliance with yeah. the person. If you if you do, if you have a good one, yep, yep. certainly patients have problems with their providers. But if you have a good relationship, now all of a sudden this story Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with your brain. It's just a story. And this, this clinician, this professional is telling you this is going to help you. Then you get the actual prescription. That's yeah. even more powerful. And so, so Kirsch, yeah. Irving Kirsch, he talks about, okay, if you get an injection of something versus an oral yeah. thing, placebo effect is much higher. Yeah. Um, if the pill is, you know, a certain color. If it's a capsule, so all these things, you know, affect us mostly subconsciously. If you get a generic drug mm. versus a brand drug, yeah. the placebo effect is different. Um, active placebo versus inactive. So when people start having side effects, when they're in clinical trials, for example, oh, my stomach is hurting or, you know, I'm sweating more or something yeah. like that. Um, then they realize, oh, it's working. Oh, yeah. So the side effect tells you um, it's working. So placebo effect doesn't mean like you're hoodwinked, you're dumb. It's all this information yeah. relationship. But again, the with the chemical imbalance theory, it assumes depression is an individualized problem, which right. technically, of course, it is. But that negates the economic realities, yeah. debt, yeah. your relationships yeah. um, with people. Anything you want to add to yeah. that? Well, it also, it, <laughs> it, it takes personal responsibility off the table. It doesn't, you know, like it takes me away from having to say, I, something's not right in my environment and I need to, I need to spend some yeah, time you being just have curious to adapt. about what's going on. Right. Yeah. And this, the story that you're so, it's so funny that you're sitting here talking about like that um, when a client comes in immediately, they're like, oh, yeah, like it's just like that. It's, it's the relief. I hear clients say that so often. Mm -hmm. I feel relieved. I feel relieved. Yeah. And I'm like, well, we haven't even done any work yet. Like, we, like <laughs> but I appreciate I that. So but many we're, people yeah. are lonely. Yes. It's much. It's it's weird how it's kind of flipped. Where yeah. you can say you're depressed, but I don't hear anybody say they're lonely. I mean, people right. say it, of course, but it's like there's much more of a stigma. Yes. To loneliness, because that, of course, is a social mm -hmm. process. You can feel alone in a crowd. Right. Like the expression. Um, but if you're depressed, and if it's just chemical, yeah. it's just in your brain. Then, like you're saying, there's no agency to that. Right. Right. You just got to take. Right. pill and make it go away. And the, the, the whole key that like when you talk about the placebo effect, essentially you're, you're in my mind, I, what I'm hearing is we're talking about, it's a mindfulness piece, right? It's the minute I attack, I, I become aware of something and I start basically assigning or aligning to, to yeah. what is going on around me in this moment. I feel differently because I'm now I'm tuning in to what's going on. And so I may not, I may not have actually gotten anything, but the power of suggestion is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And if I'm mindful about that and I, you know, and I understand that I'm paying attention, um, now I'm going to, I'm going to sense something different. I'm going to feel something different without even necessarily understanding that the, the reason it feels different is because you just came out of autopilot and you're, you're, you're coming out of your story basically. Yeah. Right. And you're, and, and you're, you're listening to someone say to you, Oh, it's going to be okay. Everything's mm -hmm. gonna be okay now, right? right? Or the medication, you know. Oh, they listen to the commercial, right? The the the, the I'm getting the beach. I'm getting the beach, <laughs> and my dog's happy, and Everyone's I'm happy. Smiling. Everybody's smiling, and you know, you barely can hear that low voice that talks for like ten minutes in the background, telling you about all the 
side effects that are coming. Yeah, but it's like, like it's like the yeah. micro machine guy, if you remember <laughs> <Right>? that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Talking super fast. Yeah. Yes. And so I think there's a lot this to be said about that. This might kill you and make you throw up and everything, but you'll right. be smiling and happy. <laughs> yeah, but everything will be fine on the way out. It's going to be great. Um, but I think that that's a really powerful, powerful thing. And and these are the kinds of things that people can start doing to kind of start rewriting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the template, right? Because so much of, we've talked about in the past about the, the story, right? We become our stories or we, we believe our, that the Take stories that we've decided, yeah, are our realities. And until we get a break with that, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of times that's what the medication represents is the break. The visit to the doctor represents the break in the monotony of the life that we're in and the autopilot that most mm-hmm. of us are operating under. And if you just took just even the powerful um, nature of thinking, oh, it's better just because I took action to something else, we, we could get rid of the the pills in, in a lot of and in a lot of ways, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's that it's that piece of like coming out of autopilot, taking action and moving in a direction, a new direction that usually inspires us and makes us feel the either we feel better or we feel less less mm-hmm. bad. Yeah. Or let we perceive that things are less bad then. And and just to clarify, and people can look up there's a there's a I think a twenty minute um, 60 minutes episode where, where, um, Irvin Kirsch is kind of profiled. He is a psychologist. He did maybe still does a fair amount of psychotherapy. So he says the antidepressants work. He's right. exploring the mechanism for how they work. Yeah. And he's saying it has little to do with what's actually in yeah. the drug. Mm-hmm. And it's your expectation, mm-hmm. your frame of reference. Mm-hmm. Like if you buy into you are your brain and yeah. it's a chemical imbalance and then bam, it's going to um, work. And, and we're not dismaying people from going and seeking no. out that that treatment, that treatment. But you have to remember, like you mentioned, there's tolerance. Yeah. So your brain will change and adapt based on... Yep. Um, you know, the, what SSRIs do essentially is they, they block the serotonin from getting, yeah. um, well, it's called reuptake. So from, from, uh, getting back like into the receptor. So it stays in this, in this gap, which is the increase in, in serotonin, right. but you, you get that tolerance effect. Um, there's lots of literature on this, but then also side effects and especially yeah. sexual yeah. side effects. When you're talking about play and joy, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you're affected that way, psychotherapy, unless you have some real yeah. crazy therapist, you're not, you're not likely to have a tolerance to it and you're not going to have side effects. So what Kirsch talks about is, uh, and there's research for this, that you could, you could give a Prozac, you know, labeled mm-hmm. uh, capsule with sugar inside of it. And there'd be this effect if you had yeah. a good alliance with the clinician, yes. but um, that's not well known. So he says antidepressants may be nothing more than active placebos producing side effects through chemical means and therapeutic effects only through psychological means. So mm-hmm. same thing, a cup of coffee. You could give me yeah. a decaf cup of coffee and tell me it's it's regular and the body would create those same right. psychological yes. <laughs> effects and yeah. really change, you know, change yeah. it. So it's really amazing how... Uh, consciousness works. So when he talks about specifically depression, the placebo effect in the treatment of depression is very large and is likely to be even larger in clinical practice than it is in clinical trials because you have mm-hmm. an actual relationship yes. with with the provider. So people listening, it's not it doesn't work or these are right. bogus. It's just the mechanism working is more of a relational process yeah. And, yeah. And, and your frames of reference about it. But when we think about real little kids taking these medications yeah. and having um, side effects like I'm talking about. I mean, then then it's then you're getting it into informed consent. And is that, mm-hmm. you know, are they being told what's happening? And um, and I'm 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 blathering here. So I'm going to jump to <laughs> our burn questions. after reading. Yeah. Our Perfect. favorite segment. Uh, script analysis questions from Eric Byrne. We did this uh, last time. I'll let you oh, talk about play and spontaneity. We don't okay. know Let's what see. the question is. Okay, it's not I'm scripted, speaking. but we could just be lying about it not being scripted. Oh. So you never know. I think I'm trying to grab more than one. There you go. Okay, what do we have? Oh, my goodness. What is your favorite animal? Did I just tell you my favorite animal? Or the favorite animal? Favorite animal? Yeah. Why? 
My favorite animal is uh, a monkey. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just Tell I, us. I love I love them because they well probably because they are similar to us in many regards. Mm -hmm. um, but I I appreciate because I think. Um, we try to complicate things as humans sometimes, um, and I associate that with a need for self-importance. But at our core, you know, we're pretty basic. We're primates. We're pretty, yes, yeah. we're basically. We're we'll pretty, talk about evolution yeah, next time. We're, <laughs> we're pretty basic. And so, what I love about watching monkeys is that they don't they don't infer a lot of extra whatever into their in, <laughs> into what they're doing right they don't carry anything around <laughs> with them they are in their moment and they're responding and dealing with whatever's going on you know and i just find it so interesting and how social they are yes yeah. they are and they they've got their rules for engagement right they've they take care of their young and they they have certain you know ways in which they conduct themselves and play and you'd see how they how they'll you know play with their with their young or how the young just mm -hmm. you know go around and play and the different roles that they take on and um and you just see the different parts of them that is relational in my mind right because they do there's that sense of community there's that mm -hmm. you know they're kind of always around each other and they're um and i just i love to watch them because i think they they are so intelligent anyway, um, but they are just not bogged down with the stories um, that they tell themselves or that they uh -huh. take on from the environment around them. Well, they're just in the moment yes. all the time. Yes. Yeah. And so you could see how this in a clinical setting would maybe go into, okay, the different generations. Cause you talked yeah. about, you talked earlier about your father yeah. and that, that you could open the door to that. But I remember also in this, um, this example of a script question, which is getting at your life plan, would you, if you were going to be an animal, would it be mm -hmm. different than monkey or would you still go monkey or is that just a Ooh. favorite? Yeah. If you had to pick one, did you ever so see the movie, uh, the lobster no. with Colin Farrell? No. Derek, have you seen that one? I'm going to have to oh add it gosh, to Oh my gosh, it's very good. List. Very dark. Oh, it Very is. dark, but you know, the dark lobster. comedy kind of, but. Okay. Yeah, it's good. But they, the, yeah. well, the setup is that um, you have to find a, in this kind of dystopian future, you have to find a partner to get mm. married. And if you don't, within a certain time, you go to this like <laughs> re-education place or something, yeah. kind of a, it's kind of a hotel with very dark, I don't want to give too much away, but <laughs> if you don't find a partner match with somebody, yeah. you turn into the animal of your choice. Oh, so uh, okay. Colin Farrell says he's going to be a, a lobster. A lobster. Mm-hmm. Mm. They're That's fertile throughout the yeah. life cycle. They live yeah. a long time. With this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> His reason for it. I, uh, you know, I would say getting older, um, it would have, it would change, you know, back when I would have said probably tiger is mm -hmm. what I would want to be. Uh, but now I, I would say absolutely. That was monkey. when you were a new mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, yes. The, 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 yes. Yeah. Mama bear, you know, energy, but, mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, I would say as I've gotten older now, it, it would be great because one of the things that I recognize is that my joy is highest when I am living in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I can experience the most um, gratitude and the most, you know, the most optimism because the, the problem that so many of us have because of, you know, our experiences and our stories and then obviously messaging that's coming from all different directions all the time is that there is like um, there there's no shortage of fear available to you mm -hmm. or anxiety, worry, things that um, aren't that you think should be or that because we think we're completely think separate be. right self-existing right so then it's, it's what buddhism calls delusion it's the rob yeah it's the it's it's the thing that robs our joy it's the thief mm -hmm. they say of joy right but the but the thing for me too that i that i think is the most important is you know when people say well what is the solution to addiction what you know how do you you know how do we solve this problem and i would say we need to figure out how are we going to restore joy and how do we yeah. how do we get people to feel hopeful again intimacy with people yeah, yeah because and that's what usually brings it right um i was just talking to my partner yesterday and i said you know we had we had a great weekend and i and i said you know it's just the knowing feels so reassuring 
and I and he knew what I meant. It's just like we're together and everything is so good when you know we have fun and life is good and we and we just enjoy our moments and things. And I and I said it's just the knowing that brings like that. You don't peace. need something yeah. additional. I don't need anything yeah. outside of that moment. Mm-hmm. Um and and it and it is the most liberating thing Mm -hmm. because we spend so much time just constantly outside ourselves or or thinking that we're missing something within ourselves and we're seeking it out um well that's where you know sorry to interrupt you but zen buddhism focuses on ego Mm -hmm. and that which is craving be craving in a sense of lack which are basically two sides of the same coin right. uh, we understand ourselves we can always criticize ourselves so we're not yeah. good enough and so you can't get rid of craving what you right. can do is you can see it manifest in your mind and let go of it this is yeah. where meditation comes in but so you know you can be a little more like you use the term mindful um appropriate kind of responses so like yeah having a glass of wine right blacking out on right. friday night like there's differences to what's gonna um happen there but when you were talking about um monkey as your favorite animal uh there's a netflix documentary chimp empire kind of interesting the title Ooh, I but like yeah. these different you know groups of of chimpanzees what i didn't realize uh was that you know they mostly eat plants that's mm-hmm. what that's what primates tend including us mm-hmm. uh and they'll eat meat but interestingly when they're full when they really don't need food mm-hmm. that's when they hunt more and the reason is it's the social process because if i kill a, another ape or something yeah. right i can decide i'm going to give some to angel i'm going to give a tiny bit to derek <laughs> or i'm not going to give any to this one yeah. so it's part of social hierarchies wow and that so so they'll hunt more not because they're hungry, because it it it's the clan, you know, it's the group, and how those dynamics change. I'm gonna I'm gonna exclude that person. I'm gonna give you some because yeah. I really like you. So I just thought that was interesting that you know we think of like I'm a vegetarian or I'm a vegan or I'm a, a carnivore is yeah. like there's a social process. Yes, to that I tend yes. to just eat whatever anybody offers me and not say anything. It's like yeah. just happy to get it done with. Yeah, you know? but, yeah. Uh, oh but yeah. it's a relational uh, process, and, and you know, going back to the the animal idea i go wolf that would be favorite i think i would i would probably be a wolf that or a dragonfly because i'm really independent and i like to be alone and do stuff on my own which but you think of a wolf is like they're part of a pack yeah but they can also be on their own yeah if they have to be or you know at times they are and then so i have dharma my new therapy dog in training is all black dog she looks like a little wolf well she's not little anymore but like a Aww. wolf pup and so that would so i would probably want to be a wolf um yeah that that's good i like does that, that say anything too. can you psychoanalyze yeah. me based on that? <laughs> well i would say you're observant then right like you like to kind of like observe all around you yeah. and pay attention and and like you kind of have that like um like you know when you're looking at a wolf look you're not sure like is the wolf contemplating like what's going on? I thought on? you were going to say, I look like I'm for... either going to yeah, come for, like, close to you yeah, or yeah, kill you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like it's that mysteriousness of like, well, what uh, what are we thinking behind the eyes, right? Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're just taking it in and you're observing. and. Well, I remember we were talking stock, about this at, yeah. a, at like a work party and my partner was with me and I said wolf and she said eagle and somebody said, don't wolves eat eagles? <laughs> like, well, well, they may. Like, it depends, I suppose, on. like what mood they're in, I suppose. In the day. No, that's yeah. that's good. I like that. Yeah, it's always it's, interesting to see what people's animal preference would be. Yeah, have to yeah take kind that of spirit to animal. There yeah. you go. Um, well, thanks so much uh, yeah. for coming on today. This is Angel Uribe from Stages of Change. I feel like we covered a lot of stuff, Always. some controversial stuff, uh, got a little play in there <laughs> yeah. as well. So thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks.